Hello and welcome back to the NBC Sports Podcast. My name's Andrew Sullivan, joined by Connell Scruggs, J.P. Eisenhower, and Andrew Feeney once again today as we look forward to tomorrow night's matchup between Marist and Hampton, an out-of-region game for senior night as the seniors will be honored tomorrow night. And big news, Marist seniors will be allowed into the game sitting in the end zones Connell, really excited to have at least some of the students back at the games tomorrow night. Should bring good energy into the stadium. Right, definitely. And I think even more than usual because this is, I mean, as of now, this is going to be the only planned game that they're able to attend. So I think they're going to bring a bunch of energy to the stands, which is going to help the team play well. And, you know, it's senior night and you look forward to seeing all the seniors getting out there and playing. And with the seniors in the stands, there's going to be a different atmosphere tonight. Yeah, I think definitely in the red zone is going to be where you hear the crowd noise the most. I mean, it's definitely going to be interesting when you get down in the scene with the seniors in the end zones. Yeah, I think it'll be weird to get like accustomed to, but yeah, I mean, be a little weird. I think it'll it's it's better to have them there than to not have them there. And I think right. it stadium was a little dull against yeah. Totally Innocence. It should be fun. Um, Toga, and, I've heard. Yeah, Toga night. Yeah, Toga, Toga night, I mean, which will that's, be that's a tradition. Fun. I think the seniors just are really happy. The football players are happy to have them back. Too. It's not ideal, obviously, but I mean, getting some students in there to liven up. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the football revolves around momentum, and right. we can't feed off momentum when there's no no crowd to cheer us on. So, no, and although this might not be the biggest game of the year, I think uh, if the students do what they're told to follow the rules, I think that could set up for them. Right. Being allowed to go to f- future games, uh, much bigger games down the road, which is exciting. Uh, Marist versus Hampton. Hampton, a team Marist has never played before. Relatively new school. Connell, what have you seen out of Hampton coming into this Friday? Uh, well, Hampton started the season one and two, uh, picking up a loss versus Union Grove in week one and a loss versus Trinity Christian in week three. Both losses six to forty eight, so kind of got blown out in those two games. But they did pick up a win versus McIntosh uh, in week two. Um, you know their offense is it's kind of a hybrid. They they use the pass and the run about the same amount. Um, one thing that uh, Hampton is going to have to be pretty careful about is their turnovers, especially interceptions. Quarterback Hunter Hensley had a rough week last week versus Trinity Christian. He, Christian, he threw four picks, which. You know, going in a game against Maris, you can't expect to give up four picks and be even close in the ball game. No, definitely, Connell. I think they need to sharpen some things up to uh, have any sort of chance against Maris this week. And the key to the, getting their offense going revolves around getting that running game going and their star running back, Untavius Varner, um, shifty. He needs some good blocks from his offensive line, but once he gets outside, he can break tackles. Um, it'll be big to see Maris tackle well this week and shut him down if they can. As we take a look at the 4A composite rankings this week, Maris still unanimous number one at 2-0 and to start the season. Big win last week, 23-3 against Woodward. Jefferson 2-0, and Benedictine 3-0, and Carver Columbus 1-0, Bainbridge all the way down to 5 after their uh, blowout loss to Valdosta, their 0-2 to start the season. Uh, but really tough start to the season for them. Right. Especially Valdosta. That's a really tough team to play against. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think one thing I'm actually glad is that the only time we'd see Jefferson is in the playoffs. Jefferson's definitely going to be one of the... I mean, they're number two. They're definitely going to be, other than Marist, the best team going into the playoffs. And I think they're continue. They're definitely going to be the cemented number two team throughout the season. Well, and Bainbridge, I mean, don't have to face them either, not in the region, but uh, I think five spots a little... Interesting. I mean, they moved them down three spots just because they lost to Valdosta. Right. That's, that's not exactly. You, you can't even uh, really look at that yeah. game when evaluating that. They're team. not. That's not really. It's just totally comparable class. teams. Um, but they're zero and two to start the year. Need to get a bounce back win this week. Stevenson still hasn't played a game, but they're in the sixth spot. Um, still waiting on Cab County to start games. Theoretically, should be next week. Flowery Branch two and one Jenkins. Um, hasn't started to play the game, but they're at the eight spot. Hapeville at 0-1 and, and Mays at 2-1 and one to start the year. Rounds out the top 10. Still three teams in Maris region. Stevenson, Hapeville, and Mays in the top 10. Hapeville suffering a loss to, uh, I believe it was North Forsyth last year, or last week, a 7A school, 28-14. And they dropped like 
seven spots in the rankings, six spots in the rankings due to that. I think the problem is some teams just haven't started, so they're moving up when other teams right. lose. Yeah. I mean, most of these, a lot of these losses are to bigger 7A schools, 6A schools. I think you'll see the Hapeville bounce back up in the rankings later in the year. Right, and that's that's a huge thing with the COVID implications is a lot of these games are having to be scheduled like a week-by-week week basis, so see a lot of these smaller teams having to schedule large teams that they wouldn't normally play, and so you get blowouts like that. So early in the season, it's kind of hard to tell which teams are good by the record. No doubt. I think uh, for Marist, it'll be a good region to play in, though you'll get some competition, assuming uh, assuming DeKalb County gets back on the schedule. I mean, they'll still play Hapeville and Mays even if they don't, but they really need those games or else they'll be left out in the dark with four open spots in the schedule. As we take a look at the games of the week in uh, GHSA, we'll start off with a big one with some smaller schools. Crisp County, the number two ranked team in 3A, started the season off 2-0. and And Elka, 2-1, and number one ranked team in single A private. They've been on our games of the week pretty much every week. Probably should have been last week, uh, except for that the... Their game against Blessed Trinity was scheduled so late we didn't have it on the list, but they've been playing a heck of a schedule to start the year. Um, picked up a big win against Woodward, then suffered a tough loss to Blessed Trinity 38-14 to last week. BT looked really good. Meanwhile, Crisp County um, started off with two shutouts of Houston County and Tiff County, large 6- and 7-A schools. schools there. Very impressive start to the year. And they have four or five D1 uh, recruited players on their defense, really talented defensive team. Um, meanwhile, Elka, five-time reigning single-A private champion, where as R- Crisp County is the 3A runner-up, so definitely some teams that perform well in their classifications. I think this will be a very low-scoring ball game. Elka lost some of their offensive threats after last year. Gabe Wright and Keaton Mitchell, as uh, along with their best wide receiver who went to Georgia. Uh, so I think very low scoring. I think maybe first team to score a touchdown wins this game. I think Crisp County has just enough to pull it out. They might shut out Alka again this week. Yeah, no, no doubt there, Andrew. I mean, this game is going to be extremely close because you get Crisp County, like you were saying, the defense extremely strong, but their offense kind of struggled in the first couple of weeks. You look at Eagles Landing, a team that shows up in big games, They've been known to do that across the past five years, and in each year they've won the state championship. And Coach Jonathan Jonathan Guest has done a great job playing teams like this. They they tend to play them week in week out. So looking at that, you know, just the way they play in big games, I'm gonna have to go with Eagles landing here. But I definitely think it's gonna be really close and really low scoring. Yeah, Connell, I'm gonna have to agree with you on that one. I'm going Eagles landing here. I really like their offensive line. I have a lot of confidence in them. And as you said, they really tend to show up in the big games. After winning five straight single A privates, I'm going to stick with Eagles Landing. You know, this is one I'm going to have to agree with Sella on. I do. I am going to go with Chris County. Yeah, I think it's a real close game, though. Low scoring. We'll remind you real quick of the standings coming into this week in the picks. Uh, I'll take the top spot. 16 <laughs> points, 13 and 0 in high school picks so All far. Right. Three and three in college. Uh, Feeney. Second with 15 picks, 11 and two in high school, and four and two in college. JP 13 points, nine and four in high school, four and two in college. And Connell 12 points, eight and five in high school, four and two in college. Plenty of plenty of games Lots left. Lots of room. To, Lots of pl- room to plenty, make up. <laughs> plenty of games left to pick, though. Don't worry. Uh, our second one, probably the game of the week in the state of Georgia, Valdosta, the number one ranked team in 6A, two and zero to start the season at Colquitt County, one zero. Number four ranked team in 7A. Connell, I mean, unbelievable rivalry. And there's going to be some added tension this year. Right. Huge rivalry. Almost undeniably the biggest rivalry in Georgia here. I mean, these two teams, South Georgia teams, big teams, go at each other every year. Uh, the series is tied 7-7 seven to seven since 2004. So they're kind of neck and neck in the last 16 years. And the big storyline here is Coach Rush Probst is returning to Colquitt County for the first time since he left the job in 2018 where when he was fired for misconduct. So there could be a little bit of bad blood there between the two teams, Colquitt and Valdosta. Um, but let's look at the actual football game right now. Valdosta won 50-49 to 49 last year in an absolute thriller. Um, 
It was an upset last year, Valdosta winning over Colquitt. And so far, Valdosta started the season pretty strong, beating Warner Robins 28 to 25 and Bainbridge 45 to 7. Um, but the one problem they do have is their star quarterback, Jake Garcia, who is committed to Southern Cal, will most likely not play this game because his eligibility currently is being questioned by the GHSA. Um, but they do have backup Amari Jones, who's filling in for him. He had a great game versus Bainbridge, passing for 205 yards in his first start. And he made a few athletic throws, so he definitely looks good. Uh, as you, lo- you look at the Colquitt side, they beat Banneker 51-0 to last week. That's the first game they've played since co- COVID canceled their first two. Um, and Xavier Williams, who made his first start at quarterback, was 12 for 22 for 225 yards. So these teams both extremely talented. But just looking straight up at the quarterback matchups, I think Valdosta has the edge there. And I think they've played a, they've played a couple solid opponents to start. And I think, especially in Bainbridge, that's that you know they're a solid opponent. But I think they're just a little bit more of a solid team overall. They've proven themselves a little bit more this year. And with, with Coach Rush Probst behind the wheel, I think they'll take it over Coquit County in a close one. No doubt. And I think uh, Valdosta still has a talented quarterback, Junior Amari Jones, back up to Jake Garcia. Um, and as you said, probably not playing Jake Garcia due to eligibility questions. And I mean, it's the right call if you're Valdosta, because if he does play and then he's ruled in eligible by the GHSA, you have to forfeit all the games he played in, which already would be the first one against uh, right. Warner Robins, I believe. So. Um, not really worth it to take any risks, but I think a shootout and a heck of an environment uh, at Colquitt definitely going to be crazy one there. I'll take Valdosta though in a in a pretty close one. I agree with both of you. I'm sticking with Valdosta. I've picked them. I think both weeks, two weeks in a row now. Um, no reason to change, obviously, other than their quarterback. That is a high powered offense going. Two high powered offenses really. But at the end of the day, I think Valdosta is going to take this one. Yeah, I don't see any reason to go against Valdosta in any week, so I'm going to take Valdosta also. I think also Valdosta has that big game experience already right. playing against uh top team in 5A, Warner Robins, winning 28-25 in a comeback. Uh, and Colquitt County just getting started hasn't played a close game yet. So should be very, very competitive one there as we take a look at our third game of the week. JP Hapeville, 0 and 1, number nine and 4A, taking them the, on the number nine team in 7A, Milton, who's starting off 1 and 0. Who do you have here? I'm going to take Milton in this one. Milton returns seven all region players, including their quarterback, Devin Farrell, and tight end Jack Nickel, who's committed to Notre Dame. They also get back Bryce Thornton, uh, who's a sophomore. And I think when you look at their last game versus Johns Creek, Johns Creek did graduate a lot of players last year, but that's still a really great Johns Creek team. And I really do believe that this is one of the better teams. And I think Milton is going to come away with a win in this one. No, I, I agree with you there. And I mean, Hapeville already played a, a 7A school in North Forsyth who's not ranked. And now they have to play the number set nine ranked team in seven. I, I don't think it's just too big of a school, too high powered Milton team to compete there. I think Milton wins running away here. Right. Uh, I'm going to go. I agree exactly with what you just said, Andrew. I'm going to pick Milton in this one. All right. I'm going to go against the pack and I'm going to pick Hapeville for this one. <laughs> I think it'll be fun to get to see Hapeville play a yeah, big game, though. Hey, so Feeney's got I the have upset a, pick yeah, here. I'm going you, with the you upset. You can't get mad at him. He's and got Hape, the upset pick. Hapeville's in Marist region, so it'll be fun yeah, one to be cool. see them try and compete against Milton. Uh, the 7A state champions from two years ago, as we take a look at our last uh, high school game of the week, Mill Creek at Brookwood. Uh, big game out in 7A. Num- 1-0 one, one is Mill Creek. 2-0 and o is Brookwood. It's at Brookwood. Mill Creek, the number five ranked team in 7A. Brookwood, the number seven ranked team in 7A. Uh, but Mill Creek didn't get started until last week. Um, and they won a close one, 20-14 over Bro- over Decula. And Brookwood got started in the first week of the season. And they took on Decula then in the Corky Kell beat them in four overtimes. So definitely a, a close one here. Brooklyn quarterback Dylan Lonergan is a top five passer so far in all of the state. Um, he's thrown for over 750 yards in two games, uh, racking up the points. Should be a high scoring one here. He's thrown to two um, Division One offered wide receivers, two Samuel Mbake and Danil and Morris set. I think this Brookwood high-powered offense, they're on a roll 2-0 and to start the season. I think they make it 3-0 and with a win over Mill Creek. Right, I'm gonna go 
with you, Andrew, on this one too. I'm going to go with Brookwood here. I just think their offense is too high powered for Mill Creek to start, although they're an extremely talented team. Yeah, I'm going to stick with you guys. I'm going to go with Brookwood, really high powered offense. I like Dylan Lonergan a lot, so I'm going to go with Brookwood in this one. And then I'm going to make it all four for Brookwood. Wow. Four, four, right. take the number seven in seven A instead of the number oh, five in seven A. Unexpected there. Um, as we'll shift a little bit into college football here, SEC finally getting underway here. Should be a not not too many big games this week, but should be some big games coming up very soon. Good to have uh, the SEC back, biggest conference in college football. Connell, Alabama and Missouri, not one of our games of the week, but real quick, just <laughs> tell just tell JP how much they're going to win by. They uh, won't cover. They won't. What's, what's I, the spread? I truly believe it's a 27 point oh, spread. Okay. They're covered. They're Come covered. On, they JP. Come on, JP. Man. Nope. I don't Come think on. they cover. All right, that's fine. You could think that, but I think they cover. <laughs> I, I, I like don't think your they op- cover. I like JP, your optimism, I, I, JP. I nope. like JP, optimism. you want to put money on that or what? How much money? No. It depends on no, how much no. money I'll put on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, but Anyways. we'll take a look at our first uh, SEC game of the week here. Number 23, Kentucky traveling to number eight, Auburn. Should be a good one there. Feeney, who do you have? You know, it's a really tough game to pick this early in the season. It could be a very, um, very determining game for a, ter- a game that determines the season for both teams. Obviously, Kentucky coming in at number 23, a veteran quarterback, Terry Wilson, looking for a bounce back year after being injured last year. He led Kentucky to their first 10 win season since 1977 in 2018. A lot of confidence in him. They got a lot of playmakers on offense as well. But looking over to the Auburn side with Bo Nix, he's looking to make a leap this year after winning um, SEC Freshman of the Year controversially. Um and he looks True. to become that star QB and the leader that they need on offense and I think he has the capability to do that with threats like Seth Williams on offense. Uh, going into their defense, Kentucky lacks on the defensive side of the football, but Auburn Auburn does not. Auburn's got a really good linebacking core and KJ Britton, Zacoby McLean. It's gonna be tough for Kentucky to win this one. And first game of the year, it's gonna be a tight one, but I think Auburn wins by ten. Yeah, I think it's a good one. I think uh, probably the biggest SEC game of the week. I think it's the only one where two ranked teams are facing off. Uh, I got to go with Carver Atlanta, Star Smoke Monday, and the Auburn Tigers in this one, though. Yep. Uh, Against my better judgment, I'm going to go with Auburn as an (laughs) Alabama fan. I'm going to pick Auburn. I think, you know, Bo Nix got a year under his belt to mature. He's going to be throwing a Seth Williams who is criminally underrated on Mm -hmm. offense and throw that in there with that that powerful Auburn defense, which we see every year. I don't think Kentucky's getting over that. Might be the only time you see Connell, hear Connell pick Ever. Auburn this hey, year. Man. Yeah. I gotta I gotta give credit where it's due. And you know, Andrew mentioned Smoke Monday. I think Connell remembers a hundred and one <laughs> yard pick six and a few few great Auburn defensive plays in that Auburn versus Alabama game last year. But on a more serious note, I think Bo Nix is definitely gonna make a leap from last year to this year. And he played pretty well last year. He had a, obviously some freshman problems. But I think he does correct those, and I think he does have a dual threat quarterback ability, which will definitely help him. And I think this Auburn defense is going to be at the level it was last year. And I really think this Auburn team is going to be a competitor in the division this year. Back to you, JP, for our second one here. Number 16, Tennessee at the South Carolina Gamecocks. Maybe a most intriguing SEC game of the week. What? Who do you have here? You know, I really like Tennessee in this one. I think when you look at it, I think Tennessee has the better offense but they don't have quite as good of a defense as South Carolina. But I think overall, I think Tennessee is just more talented and they have the momentum coming in from last year. I think that they can make some, I think Tennessee is a team that can make some noise in a normal SEC year. I think it's definitely going to be harder in an all SEC schedule, but they could definitely still make a lot of games competitive in the schedule as an all SEC schedule. And Jared Garantino, the Tennessee quarterback, I do have faith in him to be able to pull this game out. Yeah, I think the hype train's kind of building on Tennessee here recently. Uh, I think it might take a take a drop after this one, though. Uh, <laughs> similar to Florida State, you know, they b- build the hype every year and then they fall through. Uh, who is hyping up Florida State? Let me. No, some hey, people yeah. every year some people are saying Florida State's going to be back, <laughs> and then they <laughs> then no, they that's lose. Texas. I think you're uh, confusing them with Texas. Texas. Then they lose their <laughs> opening game. I'll take Tennessee losing this one to wow. South at South Carolina. 
Uh, South Carolina new quarterback, uh, Colin Hill, transfer from Colorado State, beat out Ryan Holinsky. I think you'll like what you see from him this weekend. And South Carolina wins at home in a close one. Yeah. I'm going to go against you, Andrew, here. I'm going to go with Tennessee. I'm going to agree with JP. I think they're going to build off the momentum they made at the end of last year. They started off the year kind of horrendously, but at the end mm-hmm. of the year, they really picked it up. And now they have a bunch of talent at, at offensive line. And I think they can really control the run game in this game. And and I think that's going to be a big factor. Yeah, like you just said, Connell, and JP said earlier, a lot of momentum after last season. And that offensive line is deep. Multiple five stars on that offensive line that are seasoned veterans, along with the transfer, Cade Mays. Still waiting for the SEC approval to play. Um, But if he gets the clear to play, who, I don't know, man. I mean, this vol, the volunteers, defensive backs as well, they're good. They're good. They're solid enough to keep um, Colin Hill in check. But right now, I'm going to go with Tennessee in this one. Tennessee lost to Georgia State last year, guys. Come on, man. That was last year. <laughs> that was week one last year before they started get char- Yeah, I told the you. They started the season horrendously. They got yep. some momentum, they'll, they'll, though. They'll do it again this year. You know what I see? I think this is going like, to be like Syracuse versus UNC week uh, one for no. so long. <laughs> our last, uh, the spread's three and a half, not like yeah, it's, 20. It's three and a half. La- it's a close one. Yeah, our last uh, last game here, last uh, main game here, twenty number 24, Louisville. Tough loss last week against Miami. Travels to number 21, Pittsburgh. Feeney, who you got? You know, it's obviously a disappointing loss for Louisville last week. Um, they Going into Pittsburgh, though, they got the senior quarterback, Kenny Pickett, obviously one of the most underrated players in the league, currently has 500 passing yards and three touchdowns. And that defense on Pitt, while Pitt always seems to have a great defense, they held Syracuse's offense to 170 total yards of offense and forced two turnovers. Pitt has two of the best defensive ends in the in all of college football, definitely one of the best D-lines in the conference with Patrick Jones Jr. and Rashad Weaver. They're both studs. The Cards offense, they have a lot of firepower, but so far they haven't been able to keep, like score when it counts and I want. I really wanted Louisville to do well this year. I thought their offense could make up for a lack of defense, uh, and they could run the table in the ACC. But it turns out Pitt looks like they have the best chance to run the table behind Kenny Pickett. So I'm going to go with Pittsburgh in this one. Yeah, I'll take Pittsburgh as well. Good start of the season. I like what Narduzzi's done up there. Um, I'll take them in a win. I don't. Louisville just didn't look good enough last week. I'm also going to go with Pittsburgh. They kind of had a week showing versus Miami and. Or not, not Pittsburgh, but Louisville had a week showing versus Miami, and that Pitt defense is kind of dirty. So I'm gonna go with Pitt. Yeah, I'm not gonna have Louisville make me look dumb again like they did last week versus <laughs> uh, Miami. We don't talk about that. We were we were <laughs> we all saying how yeah, we don't talk Miami about that. shouldn't have been ranked, and Louisville was gonna blow them out. It was we all looked very dumb last week, and I'm not gonna let that happen again. I'm picking Pitt, and I'm gonna oh, make it four man, four it, you're gonna look really dumb. We if all Pitt look, loses Pitt this. Pitt time. Is where, okay, right. but I. <laughs> I trust Pickett a lot more than I do Cunningham right now, and that Louisville defense is a major concern for me, so I'm going to pick Pitt. Yeah. Real quick here, uh, our upset picks for the week. We're bringing them back. Three points if you get it right. Must be a over 10-point spread. I'll take Army over Cincinnati. Cincinnati a, apparently a c- playoff contender, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I according like, to some at, ESPN at experts. Desmond Howard. I really like what Munkin's done up there with the Army program. Brought them back to 10-win season, which is unbelievable for a uh, military academy i'll take all army over cincinnati this week nice one. all right in my upset pick i have the troy trojans upsetting number 18 byu cougars uh byu right. kind of had a blowout win versus navy but i think Tr- troy kind of has the chance to make a little noise here behind gunner watson the quarterback he went 26 for 37 in this first game for 248 yards and two touchdowns uh not to mention Troy's offense combined for a total of 500 yards uh, in their first game versus Middle Tennessee State. You know, not really a great opponent, but they did put a lot of points up, and that is a good recipe for an upset. So, Troy, I got them in this one. I'm going to go with Ole Miss over Florida. You saw John Rice Plumley have a little bit of a breakout game last year against LSU, and a lot of people are hype on Florida. There's not a lot of evidence for Florida to be this good. I think there's a good chance that Ole Miss makes the upset this year. And I'm going to take Georgia Southern over number 19, Louisiana. Georgia Southern had 33 players scratched from week one due to COVID. Eight of them were starters, and they still won the game. 
and you have junior nose tackle CJ Wright and senior running back Wesley Kennedy the third coming back this week. And he had Wesley Kennedy had 824 yards and 11 touchdowns last year. And you look at quarterback Shea Wirtz, who threw for 53 yards and a touchdown. And then also in the run heavy offense, ran for 155 and a touchdown. Louisville looked really vulnerable last week versus Georgia State. And I think Georgia Southern gets the upset here in a 13 and a half point spread. Connor Sigelski in the <laughs> Georgia Southern team. JP's got him for the upset as we. We'll take a quick second to repick our college football playoff predictions as Big Ten's been added back. Um, oh, don't forget the Mac might be added back now. Yeah, that's I'm sure not, that'll change everything. Not a concern for my playoff board. picks. <laughs> um, I'll, Feeney, you want to start you? us off? Yeah, I'll start us off. Um, obviously, it's pretty. It's a. It's pretty uh, obvious who we, I think is going to be in. I got number one, Ohio State, number two, Clemson, number three, Alabama, number four, my Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Yeah, I'll go here. Uh, I think it's going to be, it almost has to be one team from each league unless just craziness goes down and somehow we, I, I feel like we should with these shorter seasons, we should have mostly undefeated teams. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong there. Yeah. But I think mostly undefeated teams definitely know two loss teams in it this year. Um, but I'll take one team from each of the main uh, power four conferences that are playing <laughs> right now. Um, I'll take back 12 gone. I'll take Clemson and Ohio state. I think those are definitely the favorites to win big 10 and uh, ACC. And then I'll take a few upsets here. I'll take Texas um, coming out of the big 12 and Auburn winning the SEC. All right. Um, I agree with you, Andrew. I think I'm going to pick one from each conference. But I think the conference most up for grabs is the SEC. I think every other conference kind of has one or two teams in contention. Um, and I think Ohio State is consensusly the best team in college football. With that said, I'm going to say, in no particular order, Clemson, Ohio State, Alabama, and Oklahoma uh, in my college football playoff. Yeah, I think it's going to be Clemson, Ohio State, Oklahoma, and I think the SEC is where it's going to get interesting. Uh, I think the teams you're looking at are going to be Alabama, Florida, Auburn, uh, Georgia, and Mizzou. Um, okay, let's <laughs> we could we could scratch Mizzou off that one, but the other four, I think it's going to be competitive. I think it's going to end up being Alabama, though. So I think it's going to be Clemson, Ohio State, Oklahoma, and Alabama. All right, it, it, it probably game. will. It probably will come down to the SEC championship, though. This uh, year. Definitely. and the ACC yeah, championship as well. I think it's. You never know. Uh, okay. make some noise. Hey, yeah. and honestly, I have like number COVID, five. Though. Could it could very well upset Ohio State, Penn State. Penn State. I'm high Penn on State, Penn State definitely. this year. I also nah. think the interesting <laughs> thing about the ACC. If if Notre Dame and Clemson don't lose any other games, then that regular season matchup really does not matter yeah. because it basically means that if one of them's 10 no, one of them's 9 and 1 losing to the other one, whoever wins the ACC championship. Yeah, says, exactly. Yeah. There's no way if Clemson beats Notre Dame regular season and then Notre Dame wins the rest of their games and then beats Clemson ACC that they put Clemson in an, over Notre yeah, Dame. I don't know. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. It's going so, it, to be it's interesting. It's going to depend on like who wins the games, how much they yep. win them by. It's right. really It's going to be one of really those cool. situations which well, well, here's the tends them. to have a well, lot of problems yeah. Yeah. coming with it. Yep. Here's the thing. Would you take a Clemson regular season blowout over a Notre Dame barely win in the ACC championship? I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. That's a hypothetical. The, the committee <laughs> The committee likes ch conference champions. Yeah, they, they, they like it. So That's one of their criteria. We'll wrap this up here. Good week another good week on the podcast tomorrow night marist hosting hampton 7 30 senior night festivities uh will take place at 7 10 make sure you catch all the action live on nfhs network we'll be trying to go live around seven o'clock so everybody at home can watch the senior night activities should be a good one marist hoping to move to three and oh to start their season um with one more game to go before region play thanks for jo joining us today on behalf of connell scroggs jp eisenhower and Andrew Feeney, my name's Andrew Sullivan, signing off.